Welcome to Have You Not Read, a podcast seeking to answer questions from the text of Scripture for the honor of Christ and the edification of the saints. Before we dig into our topic, we humbly ask you to rate, review, and share the podcast. Thank you. I'm Dylan Hamilton, and with me are Michael Deerham, Chris Kiesler. And today we'll be reading another question that's been sent into our website. The question reads, what happens to babies and or people with disabilities when they die? Babies who are aborted, miscarried, children who die young, etc. What happens to them? Michael. Now this question is one that obviously is emotionally charged. The concern, the way that the question is usually phrased, has to do with not with, just with babies who are in the womb, or babies who have been born, very young children, you know, one, two, three, four years old, so on and so forth. Then also the question concerns those who do not have the mental capacity. In years they have aged, but in terms of their mental capacity, they have not matured. And so the concern is what happens to these humans, those made in God's image, who were made for his glory, and yet we never see them develop to a point where they may profess faith in Christ or have the mental capacity to understand that they have the very basics, right? That they have a creator, that he sent his son for them, that they may be saved. They don't have the um, the capacity to know intellectually or spiritually, as far as we can tell. Um, Christ. And everything that we read in the scriptures when it comes to comes to salvation involves a knowing. And this is eternal life, that we would know God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. It all involves a knowing of some level, that we would know who God is, who Christ is, that we would hear news, good news, and rejoice in it and believe in it. At the very heart of all of the variety of debates between the various movements and doctrines in Christianity is about that. What do people have to know? How do people have to respond in order to be saved? And this is, you know, the difference between uh, various positions. Like, even if you're a staunch Calvinist, you would say, it is completely by the grace of God that we would know who he is, that we would have eyes to see and ears to hear, that we would be able to respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ in a positive way, that we would even want to to have Christ as Savior is a gift from God. It's the work of the Holy Spirit to give a new birth, to provide a new birth in which we come into a spiritual life. And so when we're thinking about how does this pertain to infants how does this pertain to those who do not have the capacity to respond who are essentially infants in their mind what happens when they die and they have never matured to the point where they can know critical information about god about themselves about sin about salvation so on and so forth Uh, this question can get um, phrased in a variety of ways the way i just did it is going to be similar to other people. There may be some nuances that somebody has, but it's basically the same. When people look into the uh, scriptures to try to find some help, to try to find some information that can give some degree of clarity about this, the honest assessment that we have to give is that there's not a lot there. Time and again, when we look at salvation, it is not something that somebody else does for the weak in terms of a human response. So I can't pray to God in a particular way with a particular level of faith that this unborn infant okay, will go to heaven. I can pray that. I can say that's my desire, but it, it's not something where if I confess faith in Jesus, somebody else gets saved. right? We were never, ever told that in all of the scriptures. We are constantly told that salvation is, in this particular perspective, that those who uh, who have been given the grace of repentance, the grace of faith, to to respond, turn away from their sins, and trust in Christ. So that's why when we begin to think about infants and so on, it's hard to find anything to go on. There are various theological systems which have a ready answer. Okay, so depending on your particular flavor of Calvinism. 
you might respond to it differently. You might say, well, my confession says that all infants and those who are unable to respond, God mercifully saves them and brings them safely into his presence, and he just simply forgives them for any sin they may have, especially if you're a Calvinist, you believe in original sin, you believe in total depravity, and so on and so forth, so nobody's off the hook before God, so God has to do something, and so many confessions just simply state Christ died for their sins, atoned for their sins, they're brought before God into his holy presence, and bypasses any kind of salvation by faith alone. Now, grace alone and Christ alone, yes, but in the case of these folks, faith is not operative, yet they're still saved. Other flavors of Calvinism would say faith is operative because God can do anything he wants. And so he grants them the faith to believe, which is beyond their capacity. Indeed, it's beyond anybody's merit. So God mm -hmm. just grants them the faith to believe even as they are infants. So infants are saved even from their mother's womb. And they'll point at Jeremiah or they'll put at John the Baptist and so on and say, um, God can do that, can't he? And of course, we all say, amen. Uh, so we do see John the Baptist and Jeremiah as examples, but we don't have an answer about every single infant. We have you know, particulars. It's true that some infants are saved, but those two in particular grew up and did things, <laughs> you know, yeah. and um, even with uh, David's son who passed away. Yeah. So then, so looking at biblical passages is a little bit different than looking at theological systems. Right. Right. So in the theological system, some systems say, yeah, I think it's uh, Second London Baptist Confession, I would say probably Westminster as well. Uh, I believe, I could be wrong because I'm not a covenantalist, but I, I do believe that they state that the infants they and those like them just are welcome. All saved. All saved, all elect. God grants them whatever they need to be saved, and he, and he does so to his own glory. And in this, many people find comfort and rejoice. Mm -hmm. Some theological systems would say all infants and those like them who are elect go to heaven, and those who are not elect and passed over do not go to heaven. And this, too, is the justice of God and the fact that anybody gets saved at all, anywhere, anytime, is grace to the glory of God, and we should be grateful for that. So in that sense, I'm talking about there is some who are positively chosen and elected unto salvation, and there are those who are passed over and simply not elected. For the scholars listening, that's called infralapsarianism. And then there's another flavor, which is superlapsarianism, double, double predestination, saying God actively elects these to go to heaven and he actively chooses these to go to hell before any other considerations. So in this case, they would say, yes, God actively chooses to send some infants and those like them to hell, and this is for his own glory. And the reason why people commit to these systems, mind you, usually has to do with some other commitment that they have. Hmm. Like I'm committed to a particular way of expressing who God is, and I have to be committed to that. Therefore, I have to say this down the line, a logical progression. I've, I've got to be consistent. And so there, there can be uh, some intra-Calvinistic uh, debates about that. But in any case, people who are against Calvinism just outright will always point to this particular issue and say, you're being either inconsistent about your, your doctrine of salvation because you believe in total depravity, yet here are all these, you say everyone goes to heaven if they die young enough. Mm -hmm. but they didn't have faith to believe, you know, they needed to repent of their sins. Correct. And, you know, but you know, how can that happen? So they're, they're saying you're, you're being inconsistent here about total depravity. If all infants go to heaven. And then if you say, well, God sends babies to hell, then they're saying, then you were rejecting the clear view of God as merciful and good in the scriptures. And so that's the argument against Calvinism when people, you know, I'm not against theological systems. Systematic theology has its role. It's very helpful, but we can come up short sometimes in trying to answer it from the confessions. So uh, that'd be as looking like at systems. The the idea of age of accountability is that a, a system, yes. or is that derived from age of accountability is a system? So, and other ways of looking at the situation is more not the emphasis on the will of God. The will of God, who does he elect into salvation, who does he not elect into salvation? Calvinistic systems, reform systems look at will of God. Non-reform systems tend to look at will of man as the main factor. Okay. And if babies and those like them don't have the will, okay, and the capacity, the intellectual capacity to choose Christ, then then God just brings them into heaven because systems that prioritize the will of man in the role of salvation deny total depravity 
or things like it to say, no, <laughs> you know, and we're not sinners by default. Hmm. Okay. We yeah. end up sinning, sure, but we don't run sinners by default. So babies truly are innocent. And so yeah. the age of accountability would be something along the lines very formalized in the Roman Catholic Church, which is semi Pelagian or outright Pelagian. And they would say, you have to go until you get through your catechism, age twelve, and finish your catechism you're not really accountable. So if you're if you're baptized as an infant in the Roman Catholic Church, they have this whole other thing about the treasury of grace, and you have grace infused into you through the holy water put on you, and uh, basically you're covered until you're 12. So that's a really uh, wackadoodle way of, mm -hmm. of approaching that. But other people do believe in the age of accountability. Yeah. I heard it in Baptist circles a lot, um, but yes. and I think the emphasis there was more, if you're not within the Reformed or Calvinistic system, God's sovereignty, then the emphasis is on choice. Yes. You have to have free will. And if a person is denied that or doesn't have um, the mental capacity, yes. then they didn't have that choice, then God being good would just assume them into mm -hmm. heaven. So, and so sometimes they'll say, well, what age is that? You know, and it's different depending on, yeah. now, when I was in seminary, we had um, a question in an evangelism class, how young is too young for you to witness to a child? They were concerned about that because obviously you don't want to be an emotional manipulator. And so well, he said, well, I have a test. What I'll do is um, I'll show him, I'll show him a dirty dime and a shiny penny. <laughs> and I'll say, uh, which one do you want? You know, when he knows that the dirty dime is worth more than the, than the shiny penny and picks the dime, then I know that he has a capacity to be making higher level choices or understanding higher level things than them just kind of base layer things. And then I feel free to kind of share with him a few things to see what does he know. And so that was his, I'm thinking, well, that's pretty random. Yeah. You know, and he wasn't saying that was the age of accountability, but he kind of was, you know, when they start evidencing a certain, so we're going to come back to this. I want to come back to this. When should you start um, preaching the gospel to mm -hmm. your, to your children? I want to, I want to come back to that, but to get away from the systems where you have, well, ever all the babies are elect or, you know, some of them are, but we don't know which ones on the Calvinistic side or on the, the free will side, you know, age of accountability stuff to get away from all of that and to go to the scriptures. What are we left with? Like texts that come to mind? Yeah. And so one of those ones that you mentioned yeah, was David. Um, about David. And so David was judged by God for having murdered Uriah and stolen Uriah's wife, covering it all up, so on and so forth. And one of the judgments God said was that you're, the child that Bathsheba is pregnant with, this child is going to die. And so David prayed and prayed and wept and mourned and, and he did not want that to happen. And it did happen anyway. And he stopped his mourning after the child died. And the people were, were like, why? why? Why did you stop mourning? You, you know, we, we figured you were going to do yourself in and get even worse after the child died. And he tried to explain it. And verse 22 of Second Samuel 12, and he said, while the child was alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, who can tell whether the Lord will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now that he is dead, why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. And the question is, is David finding comfort in death? The child's dead and I will go to him in death and we'll just be in death together. Or does David have, now he sits on the throne that Melchizedek used to occupy. David listens into conversations between God the Father and God the Son. Read Psalm 110. Okay, what does David know? He knows something. David's a prophet. He knows something. He says, I can't bring him back to me, but I will go to him meaning there's going to be some kind of camaraderie, fellowship, relationship, time together in the future for both of us. Mm. And he says, I take a comfort in that. Yeah. Now, to me, that is the, the clearest and brightest passage out of any one that we can find that gets closest to it. But most people look at verse 23. Go back to verse 22. He said, while the child was alive, I fasted and wept, for I said, who can tell whether the Lord will be gracious to me that the child may live? What is he saying there about the Lord? He's completely in charge. Yeah, over life and death. He's completely in charge. He, uh, he, he is so sovereign. So who can tell whether the Lord will be gracious? Who's going to say? Only God can say. So in the case, I would say this, in the case where there is an infant or someone like an infant who is deathly ill, things are not going well, bad news from the ultrasound text, so on and so forth. Pray. 
Who can tell what the Lord will be gracious? Mm -hmm. Who knows? It's his business. Who can stay his hand? Who's going to tell him how to think, feel, and do what to say? And yet in all of that, there is hope. There's a really confident hope, a hope that comforts David, King David. David refused, remember later on, David refused to be comforted about Absalom. What kind of man was Absalom? Yeah. There was no comfort for Absalom, was there? No. But he was comforted for this son. What should that tell you? Now, to me, that's the brightest passage in all of Holy Scripture, mm. and I think it's well worth meditating on, but I'm not saying that that falls within any system. You know, that's not going to be systematized with, that's not going to support in and of itself, by itself, a position in Calvinism or a position that is anti-Calvinist. There's a level of mystery. There. There's going to be a level of mystery. So given the dynamics between different systems, I think we would all agree here, we should be able to say with these other systems, this is actually mystery and shake hands, though those pre-commitments for them don't allow them to always do that, maybe? Yeah, so somebody, we were, you know, coming to the text with some presuppositions here. One side is saying, see, when babies die, they go to heaven. They're not inherently wicked, and God would be unjust to send them to hell. Therefore, he welcomes them into his presence. Somebody from the other side is saying, See, God is totally sovereign, and he in his mercy is electing these, these infants to go straight to heaven. Isn't he merciful? I agree, Dylan. I think we should just shake hands and say, this ain't on the debate table. You don't, you don't know. <laughs> we don't know, but the clearest thing we have is that infants and those like them, when they die, we should have a strong hope. Because David's taking comfort, like you said, in God's sovereignty over the situation, but also in God's character, um, his yes. gracious character, his mercy that he may have on that child and that he may have on David himself, as he said. Now, there is a great passion and desire for us to do more, especially for those who are grieving, to offer more certainty, to give even, to just give an absolute certain airtight declaration mm -hmm. for the grieving parents about their baby. I've been at funerals where there's a tiny white coffin at the front of the, of the auditorium. And that's very, very difficult to be at. And I've also been at one of those funerals where someone got up there who was in a cage stage mm. of Pado baptist covenantalism and began telling a bunch of Baptists why this family ought to have confidence that their child is in heaven because it's a covenant child and start preaching out of 1 Corinthians 7 about mm. sanctified children and go, and look, you're importing into these texts a system that these texts cannot in and of themselves sustain. At this point, your doctrine is strange to the text. I'm not saying it's necessarily an outright opposition to the text, but it's strange. And that's not the kind of thing that you should be trying to offer. The character of God, mm -hmm. this is a passage that should bring hope, comfort, but trying to eliminate all bits of uncertainty is not the way to comfort and peace. Because we're never going to be able to eliminate all uncertainty in every single, we're not going to be able to answer every single question down to the atomic level about everything. That's not how we have our peace in normal days. So in bad days, in really, really rough days, it's still not the way we get our peace and comfort. So we need to be able to trust in the sovereignty of God, the character of God, the mercy of God. And in this story, I'm so glad it's in the Bible. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I really am. I think of, there's talking about the infants and then those that are disabled. And again, you've got systems that talk about these things, this was not God's will or, or thus and such that the person be this way, but taking comfort from God is good, and God is merciful, and God is sovereign. I think of the text uh, in Exodus where he's talking to Moses, and he says, so the Lord said to him, who has made man's mouth, or who makes the mute, the deaf, the mm -hmm. seeing, or the blind? Have I not the Lord? And then he tells him to go and speak. And, and basically God is sovereign over those things, our state here on earth. He was sovereign over that child in the womb and its development. He's sovereign over our development past the womb being born. He's with us in that. And then the same thing after we die. He's sovereign over those things. And it's in his hands. And David takes comfort in his graciousness. So there are some red herrings that come up when we talk about these things. It's like, well, if you're, if you're saying that all babies go to heaven, if you're leaning that way, then why are you anti-abortion? Why are you an abolitionist? And this is a red herring, and it's 
uh, it's one that exhibits a lack of of character by those who who use it forcefully because you know it's the same way of arguing about some mass murderer mm -hmm. who sent all these people into eternity let's say he shot up a church and sent a whole bunch of people to heaven why would we be against that christianity is on a death cult death is an enemy christ is going to put that enemy underneath his feet when he returns in total victory it's the last enemy to be defeated is death and we don't as christians we never celebrate uh, something we're in trying to say the end justifies the means mm -hmm. right that's just evil right and it also for that individual that murders someone else they're guilty yes. we would rather them not commit that sin exactly so that's kind of a red herring we don't need to talk about that the when come circling back to the practical question okay beyond concern for and i'm glad people are concerned about this that's good beyond concern about what happens to babies when they die and those like them when they die is the concern of uh, how young is too young to begin to basically uh, preach the gospel uh, declare the gospel to these children and there's i think you know sing the gospel uh, pray the gospel talk about the gospel over your infants before they're ever born why stop you know why have to have a certain starting point but when when do you know if they're going to be able to respond is there a real age of accountability and so on should people say you know my two-year-old sings uh, amazing grace with true conviction and i think i think she really believes that she uh, was you know, a wretch saved just like any sinner and she sings it so sweetly i think it's time for her to be baptized and to partake the lord's supper probably a little too young how can we tell each child's going to be different. I, I reflect on Nancy Lee DeMoss talking about how clear-headed she was when she was four years old, understood sin, her need for repentance, and trusting in Christ. I'm like, praise God. You know, some kids don't become self-aware until they're 10. They're called boys. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Like, at some point, they realize they exist. I'm like, oh, oh <laughs> hang on a second. You know. Um, so, again, people want a system. They want a hard, hard and fast line. But generally, I would say that when your child begins to do more than just kind of stimulus response, you know, and learning patterns and so on, when a kid is ashamed of being naked, that's about as biblical as I can get to some sort of age of accountability. When a kid is ashamed of being naked, you can start talking to them about why God gave clothes to Adam and Eve. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, that's where that go all the way back to the beginning. To me, that's a biblical. They were ashamed. That Yeah. yeah. You know, when kids are running around naked and they don't even know any better, you know, it's like, yeah, that, that, that's something there. But when they suddenly become very self-conscious, like, oh, I, you know, this is weird. I need to be, I need to be covered. Then you're like, okay. You know, he said, yes. <laughs> Did, in your experience, does that usually come with shame for other sins too? Does it, is it kind of one on one or do you see shame uh, for other sins crop up beforehand uh, you know what I mean? Yeah, like, you can you can see other stuff start to crop up. Um, it's hard to tell at the beginning because you don't know if it's something where there, it's just kind of a learned response. Um, right. Like, you know, I've been told 20 times not <laughs> to grab this. And then it's really quiet. And dad says, what are you doing over there? You know, and they're like, Ooh, you know, and they, right. and they is that the same thing? I don't think it's the same thing. Right. But when, you know, when they start trying to hide things that they're ashamed of. Right then it's just kind of like, ah, this is this is a good time to start talking about things on their level. What is this bag of Snickers doing under your bed? <laughs> that, yeah. that kind of... Yeah. That and then wife, what, what is this bag of Snickers doing in this house? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I hope that helps. And, and again, this question I think was well phrased. I think it was a good uh, submission to the podcast. Very glad for the person who asked it. It's much better to deal with this question in a situation like this than to have it tossed out as an issue for some sort of heated debate. And we, we find this to be a tough question. Yes. Just because it's, the nature of it is a is a tough reality for us to deal with in our mortality, mm -hmm. in our uh, love for our children. This is a very, very tough topic to deal with and think through without getting emotional about it and going just when you go directly to the scriptures and not try to feel our way through it. Although feeling is greatly involved in this, we really enjoy having people send us these questions that we can go through and hopefully be helpful to everyone out there. But we'll go ahead and go on to uh, what we recommend for this week. Michael? I recommend ChatGPT4. 
I think it's pretty effective. That's an AI, right? Yes, yeah, AI. I would say that it is a, a tool that is useful for certain things as a part of your tool belt in life. I think that it could be a replacement for hard work. It shouldn't be. I think it could be an accelerant to hard work. That would be better. I think it's not meant to be a replacement for human relationships. I think it should be used as a manner of serving other people that you are in relationship with. I think that it's not a, the source of truth. I think that it can uh, help you collate truths and that you can check to see whether it has done a proper job as the tool that it's supposed to be. So I would say just like the smartphone and just like the personal computer, which by the way, anybody, PC, personal computer, just like, you know, how technology has been advancing. It's not something that inherently is evil. If you use AI, you're not contributing to the mark of the beast. You're not serving the antichrist. You know, if you use AI or chat GPT-4 for, for nefarious purposes, then it's the same as if you uh, take up a sledgehammer and use that for nefarious purposes, right? But I've been using it as a research assistant to get things done a little bit more swiftly than otherwise. And I do check all of the sources listed, but this is generative content wherein I'm asking it unique questions that no website has in and of itself, right. but 15 websites do collated. And so I'm asking this tool to do a job for me that would take me 30 minutes to do, and it's doing it for me in 30 seconds. Now that's helping me be a better pastor because I have more time. Uh, it helps me be a better father, husband, because I'm spending less time looking everything up. Now, I do check resources, and it helps to have an understanding of the field that you're in, okay? I'm not using it to replace my seminary education. So it's not writing your sermons for it's you? It's not, no, it's not at all. Docent AI. Uh, yeah, it's, it's not. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm snickering at sometimes the stuff it leaves out. I'm like, right. yeah, you forgot, you know, points five through eight and you skipped from four to nine, you know, you forgot about all these things, but it is helpful. Sometimes I, I would really put it to the test and ask it a very complicated question, multifaceted, because I know this is what I need to work through in order to be able to help feed the flock, shepherd the flock and so on. So I ask it a very thorough, complicated question. You have to be careful with your engineering prompts and you put that into the, to get it right. But then here it all comes out and it's like, I know I would have found all of that in an hour. You know, I, I would have been able to do that. I could have used my Bible search. I could have used my Bible dictionary. I could have used my commentary. I could have, and it's not as thorough, but it's all right there. And so that helps me move along at a faster pace. So it's not a replacement for writing a sermon. It's not a replacement for getting education and so on, but it is a tool that can accelerate particular portions of the labor. I find what's fascinating about AI is that it's not a, uh, even though we have like some of these highly centralized ones in general, we're starting to get really specific breakoffs like pulpit AI, like I showed you guys yeah. um, to help with sermon prep and stuff like that. And then there's stuff that there's one that is geared strictly toward Austrian economics thought and it, it accesses that database set and is able to come up with answers to economic questions really, really quickly. And I'm just imagining later on like literature texts um, or even biblical texts of like different traditions and having all that stuff collated in one place and asking a question and being able to have that spit out rather than going through all, all of those like Alexandrian text mm -hmm. on your own <laughs> or yes. um, different, different papyri on your own. And then those AI are able to do it for you. And I would say that it helps to be, have a copiousness in your field to know whether or not it's doing a good job. Right. So it's not, I mean, if, if you're a beginner and a learner, just know it's not going to give you everything. Yeah. And, and so it should be seen as kind of a starter to get going, but you're going to have to dig deeper. It is limited in how much it can bring. I like the idea of the specialized AI. So it's like particularly helpful in this field. Specific subjects. Yeah, because yeah, it needs to be refined that way. I, I don't think ultimately it's going to be the general all-knowing you know, AI that covers everything. The I more think focused it is, the better it is. That just seems like we don't know what to do with it yet. Yeah. Right. Like the, the having the, the general format come out, we're like, that's the beta test, mm -hmm. if you will, of the AI technology. And then we're going to get like very refined corners of study that we can have AI help us out with. So I'm, I'm pretty 
enthusiastic about that, and I think it's pretty forward thinking. Well, thanks for that recommendation. What do you think, Chris? I have a very short, I don't even know if you'd call this a booklet. It's just a pamphlet, maybe? I yeah. don't know. It's called, Is Capitalism Bad for the Environment? It was put out by the Cornwall Alliance, and this is particularly dealing with the green movement, climate change, and some of the claims that they make about capitalism. Kind of a caveat, he's talking about free market capitalism, not what we have now, not crony capitalism, not Chinese capitalism. You know, it's it's talking about capitalism, but he answers a lot of the charges that they'll make that, that capitalism or the West is responsible for a lot of damages to the climate um, because of a lot of different mindsets. And then uh, right off at the beginning, is capitalism bad for the environment? He asks, compared to what? And then he talks about socialism's environmental record. Okay, that's the record that socialism has. And then he brings up five charges against capitalism and he answers those. And they're pretty helpful. It's an interesting kind of discussion about maybe what capitalism used to be and then what is its involvement or uh, effects on on nature and climate change so as christians you know wanting to use our resources to steward uh, and be producers rather than just consumers i found this very interesting and who's the author on that the author is e calvin um beisner okay e calvin beisner and it, you said the Corn cornwall, cornwall alliance, alliance yeah. okay all right thanks for the recommendation this week i recommend for you to pick up a hymnal or multiple hymnals and just read through some hymns and you can get some that have hymn and psalter combinations or even a psalter itself and kind of go through and read and study the hymn study the the meter and really kind of pick apart the whole structure to how it was written and how it sounds even sometimes what I've, I've liked to do recently is I'll look at a hymn and I'll I'll find versions on YouTube that I either like or dislike and there's some hymns where I don't find a version that I like at all because sometimes the hymn is just not as well written as as the other ones and you kind of get a taste of what you find most effective for what a hymn is supposed to do or what what a psalm is supposed to do set to music. Um, but I just recommend picking up a hymn or a psalter and uh, reading through and trying to sing it and maybe even using it in your, your family worship time or as we mentioned in a previous episode to just spontaneously spark some song into your, your household. Mm -hmm. All right, we'll move on to what do we think before, Michael? I am thankful for the wisdom of Christ. I'm thankful for the way that He's given us clear instructions in his word about how to walk through difficult uh, situations, tough times in uh, families and churches and, and in, in life in general, uh, that we don't, have to be, we don't have to be lost without a clue, but that we have a good shepherd who says, uh, here's step one <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and here's step two. Come along. Here we go. And you just walk with your shepherd through very difficult, complicated things, taking his simple instructions in their you know, their most hopeful light, and then you just watch him do his work. So I'm thankful for the wisdom of Christ in that regard. I'm thankful for the wisdom of Christ that it is not a reservoir unique and solely in me, right? It's in him. He's the one who's full of wisdom, and I'm just one member of his body, and therefore I'm thankful for the wisdom of Christ in others, that I can talk with my other brothers in Christ and be encouraged and helped by them and be exhorted by them and led by them hmm. uh, into good things. So I'm just thankful for the wisdom of Christ. Amen. Chris? I'm thankful for uh, Christ sanctifying our desires. I'm thankful that we're able to have desires and ambitions and goals, things to strive for, but in that, that Christ is with us and that I can go to his word. I can trust in him to correct me if I'm striving uh, incorrectly, if I'm working towards something to the detriment of another area, that element of risk, that that can be okay. Um, I don't have to avoid risk, but I can trust Christ and pray and that he cares about listening to my prayers and he cares about what I'm doing in serving the body and serving my family. How can I do that more He's over all of that, and I'm so grateful that that we can know him in salvation and in our sanctification, in growing and being more Christ-like, that I can trust him for that. And I'm not by myself flailing, trying to fix my life, but that I have a goal to look towards. Hmm. And I'm grateful for the Spirit's work in doing that. Amen. 
Well, I'm, I'm thankful to the Lord for a group of men and brothers here at Sunnyside who can constantly throw stuff at me, content-wise, encouragement-wise, and even just sharing uh, in, in praise and sharing in the way that we, we worship our Lord together. We'll have stuff come up as a body or as individual families, and we Sometimes as a group of men, it can always end up in a joke somehow or a pun somehow. And sometimes that can be just an edifying thing for us all as well. But we know how to respond to each other because we see how Christ has set an example for us to respond to one another. And I'm so thankful for the men here at Sunnyside who do respond to me like Christ all the time. And I I know sometimes we fail in that, but man, the men here have done so well at trying to deal with brothers as brothers as consistently as possible. So I'm I'm so very thankful for that, and I'm I'm so very thankful, especially that one of them is my brother, <laughs> right? My my blood brother, and how he consistently deals with me in that way as well. Because in our past, it was not like that. Hmm. You know, it was not it was not a relationship that one would say was too far away from how Cain and Abel dealt with each other. There was a lot of physicality to it, and that's how we communicated. Me especially, but man, he has done a work in me. Our Lord has done a work in me and my Lord has done a work in my brother as well. And I'm so thankful for the brotherhood that Christ gives us. It is a absolute gift that we have with all of our Christian brothers. And that wraps it up for today. We are very thankful for our listeners and hope you will join us again as we meet to answer common questions and objections with Have You Not Read.